Thank you for turning to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at the Basilisk. And for our source, we're going to go to the Monster Manual. We're going to take a look at this nasty little creature uh, from the Monster Manual. But we're also going to take a look at the ecology of the Basilisk from Dragon Number 81. These ecology articles were real game changers, literally, for us. Uh, very often I would read the ecology article and then next thing you know, the monster would be in my, my next game. So we're going to take a look at the write-up in the Monster Manual and then Ed Greenwood's take on it from Dragon Number 81, today on page 121. also want to remind you, subscribers, come on in. Uh, I want to keep the channel growing. It's the way I'll be able to keep doing these videos. Also, please take a look at the Patreon and if there's anything you can do to help there. Anybody who's already subscribed, thank you. Everybody who's a Patreon already, thank you. Uh, I want to keep the channel going and growing, and I can only do that with your help. So that's it for the end of the commercial today, the Basilisk from Monster Manual and Dragon Number 81. The Basilisk in AD&D, used with caution, uh, without a lot of effort, this can be a total party kill. So we're going to go to page 8 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, and there's our handsome friend right there. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit, there she is. So the Basilisk, number pairing 1 to 4. That would be a mated pair with younglings. Um, six plus one hit dice. Armor class four. One attack per turn, per round rather. Damage per attack is one to ten. Its gaze turns you to stone. It is animal intelligence. It's neutral and it's medium. It's seven foot long. That must not include the tail. Uh, or maybe it does include the tail. Um, the basilisk is a reptilian monster, although it has eight legs. Its slow metabolic process allows only slow movement. While it has strong, toothy jaws, its major weapon is its gaze, by means of which it is able to turn to stone any fleshly, fleshly creature which meets its glance. However, if its gaze is reflected so the basilisk sees its own eyes, it will itself be petrified. But this requires light equal to a bright torch and a good smooth reflector. Basilisks are usually dull brown with yellowish underbellies. Their eyes are glowing pale green. The basilisk is able to see in both the astral and ethereal planes. In the former plane, its gaze kills. In the astral, it will kill you. While in the latter, the ethereal, it turns the victim to ethereal stone, which can only see, be seen by those who are in the plane or can see ethereal objects. Early AD&D worried a lot about the astral and the ethereal planes without explaining it a bunch, especially in 1977 when this was written. Uh, there was not a lot of information dealing with the various uh, planes. So that was always a little problematic. But the idea that it could see in to the other planes and cause problems was pretty neat. So now, that's just a brief write-up. There's not a lot of meat on the bone on that one. So now, flash forward to Dragon number 81. Uh, this guy is from 1984. January of 84. So to be featured next year, early next year, on... Uh, uh, my dragon, I uh, want to take a look at dragons. Right now we go to page 27, and there is The Ecology of the Basilisk by Ed Greenwood. What these ecology articles did is they took the creature from the Monster Manual, and then they fleshed it out. And kind of a pun there with uh, Basilisk being fleshed out, since they turned everybody to stone. But this, these uh, articles were really useful because they added new depth and dimension to the monsters, but they also gave us new ways to use the monsters, some things to think about. And in Ed Greenwood's case, we got a little peek at his Forgotten Realms campaign. Forgotten Realms would not be published until 87. So all we knew about Forgotten Realms were from these uh, articles in Dragon. And I, Ed Greenwood published a bunch of articles. So this is from an untitled tome in the library of Sulfon of Waterdeep. Signed, Rapfodel, Sage of Sages. And the game notations appear in this article throughout uh, in uh, italics uh, inside parentheses in the later ones they would just put them as footnotes at the end of the article uh, and then it goes on we always get a little bit of uh, a little bit of prose here to know Osage the creature creature often asked about is the dreaded basilisk it's a large reptilian brute that is both slow and stupid it's feared for its infamous ga infamous gaze which can at will turn creatures including both fish and fowl who meet it to stone um, 
Precisely how the creature's gaze works is a mystery. Most learned sages agree it shoots some kind of radiation out of its eyes. Um, interesting here, in the, the author's notes, we have stoned creatures are immediately paralyzed, unable to speak, see, or feel. They become unconscious from lack of air at the end of one round, but until then are capable of mental, i.e. psionic and some magical activity. Any spell or device supplying air or removing the need for it, such as necklace of adaptation, will allow continued mental activity with a cumulative uh, chance, one intelligence score plus 1% per turn, of going insane due to helplessness and isolation. So here it's applying that if you cannot, if you need to breathe and you can't, you stop thinking. So do you go into suspended animation or do you die? Uh, and uh, later on it says that if you can continue to breathe, you're just trapped in this immobile form and you go crazy. I know which I would prefer, uh, but since the creature in question can be turned back to flesh with a stone to flesh spell, obviously you don't die. So it's kind of interesting the author bothered to make the distinction between the two. Uh, that's not one I've ever had a need to worry about, but it is still kind of interesting. It, again, it adds some nice depth to it. Uh, clothing, accoutrements, and the like carried or worn by victims are not affected. So the stuff they're carrying does not turn to stone. So it's theoretically possible for someone to be turned to stone and then all his gear just be taken by remaining party members. And uh, we get another author's note here. Uh, wait, beings who through natural ability or use of magic are in gaseous form are also apparently immune to the effects of the basilisk gaze. I think the argument there is that you need eyes in order to be turned to stone. You don't have eyes as such in gaseous form. The use of invulnerability potions allows the saving throw versus petrification at plus two. Any rings or cloaks of protection being worn add their bonus to the saving throw as well. Uh, the use of the potion and vulnerability adding plus two, that must be a house rule from Ed Greenwood. I couldn't find any notation on that, but I thought it was a pretty good house rule, and I know I use it. Uh, Basil Basilisk has two translucent eyelids, somewhat like the membranes covering the eyes of a frog. And basically it opens the, the lid, the inner lids, to let the uh, radiation out to turn things to stone. Uh, these guys cannot move very fast. Or they, First, we'll go back to the gaze. The gaze can see about 9 inches in AD&D scale. And if it pulls up the inner lid, it can see up to 11 inches. And then in the astral or ethereal plane, it can see 7 inches, so 70 feet. Uh, Basilisks cannot see more than one plane at once, but unless they are actually fighting or hunting in one particular plane, they tend to flick their gazes from plane to plane every minute, once around, and thus remain aware of their surroundings in all three planes. This would be one that was on the defensive for some reason, if it had been irritated, agitated in some manner. When the inner lower eyelid is also drawn back, and both eyelids can be raised and lowered again in less than five seconds, a basilisk gaze petrifies all who meet the stare of one of its eyes on the prime material plane, slays all who stare at it from the astral plane, you'd have to be in like an astral window, and turns ethereal creatures to, who meet its gaze into inanimate, insensible, ethereal stone. And again, you'd need to be in an ethereal window for that. Note that Basilisk's eyes are on opposite side of its head, and thus it commands a very wide field of vision, 260 degree arc. And it can conceivably stone creatures on either side of it, two in total, in the same minute. So that's kind of neat, and actually could probably do more, since all you have to do is meet its gaze. Uh, if two of you are standing shoulder to shoulder and both met the gaze, you would have to make the saving throw, and if you failed, you'd be petrified. Uh, Basilisk is not particularly energetic or cunning, and it will not comprehend the properties of a mere other reflective device. If you maneuver it in a position, it will readily stone itself as it's trying to petrify something it fears. Petrified creatures cannot be eaten by basilisks, and they will therefore strike with their petrifying gaze only at creatures who, by size or aggressive behavior, seem threatening to them. And petrified victims who are subject to all the effects of the stone that stone, stone normally suffers. Those effects include chipping, frost damage, and other weathering, uh, horn of blasting, anything like that. Contrary to fireside yarns, stone people who are chipped or shattered do not bleed. Uh, petrification does not otherwise slay creatures who are held in a sort of suspended animation or stone sleep. Protective devices retained by a petr petrified victim, a cube of frost, frost resistance, for example, will continue to function. So I guess that means that the cube of frost resistance, if you had been inside of it when you were petrified, it would continue to function. Uh, that, that note confused me a little bit when I read this. Basilisks eat all types of small creatures. Uh, 
they avoid looking uh, directly at other basilisks and they never use their stoning gaze on one another. They will get together and mate and then the parents will have the children in their lair and the little kids, the little baby basilisks, have the full ability to petrify with their gaze, which makes things interesting because I'm going to assume that the inner eyelid uh, being closed is a natural instinct, otherwise it would turn its parents to stone and we wouldn't have any more basilisks. <clears throat> the egg it lays is uh, leathery and malleable, so it's uh, like soft leathery sack. It can be thrown around and not it will not shatter. Uh, they are cold-blooded, and they derive much of their energy from the heat of the sun, but the basilisk can store some of the energy in its intestines, and this will let it move around with some vigor, even though it's cold out. Uh, because of its fearsome petrifying power, which we should be noted is permanent, it does not wear off, the basilisk has long been sought as, uh, as a guardian. You want to put this guy in guard your treasure. The problem is these guys are pretty stupid and lazy. You've got a good chance of coming up on them while they're asleep. And then you have the problem of you getting past them without being petrified. Or if someone is petrified, getting them out of the way once they are petrified. There's a lot of problems with it. And if you decide to put a pair of basilisks together for a very long period of time as a pair of guardians, most likely eventually they're going to turn each other to stone. That was an interesting point I hadn't really thought about, about using these guys as guards. Um, and another problem is that if, if the uh, victim of a basilisk guard is successful in its stoning attack, the victim's impossible to interrogate or rescue if the wrong person is petrified and difficult to move out of the way. And But you do get all their magic because the stuff does not petrify with them. Um, so then we go on. Basilisk eggs usually bring up to 500 gold pieces each, and a miniature young one is worth as much as 700 gold pieces. Mature, less tractable, tractable specimens usually carry a price of 400 to 500 gold pieces, 450 to 500 gold pieces. So the effective range of basilisk gaze seems to be a function of how keen the eyesight of the victim is, although this tends to be only about five man lengths, 30 feet. Cases have been reported of wizards using wizard eye, Spells being stoned by basilisk guardians and persons employing crystal balls, eyes of the eagle, and similar devices being petrified at greater distances. I absolutely allow that. Uh, one of the risks inherent of having a crystal ball is some of the stuff you see. Um, you got to be careful with a crystal ball. And because the basilisk uh, can see you, I mean, that kind of means that it's not the radiation from the eye striking you. It's the magical effect of you meeting the gaze. So as I said, this article does contradict itself a little bit. And again, that was pretty common in early D&D, &D, uh, in Dragon articles, and in, in the game itself. So you just kind of wade through and, and figure out what you want to do with it. The reason Basilisk came to mind is my friend Mike, my player, just painted one up for me. This is from Reaper, and Mike painted this guy for me the other day. I think he did a gorgeous job on this. I love the treasure at its feet. Mike does tremendous detail work. And just for scale, this one's a little bigger than described in the book or in the article. But there you go. These also were painted by Mike. Mike does really good work. So there you have it. So there you have a basilisk staring down two players. And uh, they'll make their saving throw. And maybe the game will end right there. Or... Maybe they'll battle the basilisk and we'll see who wins. Either way. So that's it. That's all I've got today from page 121. I hope you enjoyed it. I've always liked the basilisk. I've used them many times. Again, you've got to be careful. It's not impossible to do a total party kill with these things. If you just happen to have a bad run, I do know that uh, those happen. Um, in a game just very recently, I threw a sleep spell onto a group. Uh, and the, the onto two of my players who were only about second level, my the player who was human automatically fell asleep, subject to the spell. The elf standing next to him, 90% immunity, threw a 93 on the percentage dice and also fell asleep. That's only about the third time I've ever seen an elf fail a check against sleep, but they do happen. So anything like this that allows a saving throw or percentage, you've got to be careful because sometimes you get that unexpected outcome and then you end up with uh, a result you didn't really want. 
So that's all I've got to say today for page 121. I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you liked it. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.